Hi everyone, my name is Shogun Bose. I am a software engineer at Intuit. And today I wanna to share with you three lessons that we learned in our journey of adopting inner source. Before I begin, I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I've been associated with Intuit's inner source program fairly from, from a fairly early stage. I had the opportunity to design and build our tooling that collects inner source metrics. I supported numerous teams in their journeys to get started with practicing inner source by helping others learn about what inner source is and how they can be set up for success. And even outside of that, now in my day to day, I've had the opportunity to both make and receive numerous small and large inner source contributions. Um, outside of my time at Intuit, I've also dabbled a little in the open source space. This year, I had the amazing opportunity to be the co-chair for the open source track at Grace Hopper. So all in all, I'm super excited to talk to you about Intuit's inner source program and my insights as an engineer. Um, and I'm really grateful, of course, to the Inner Source Commons Foundation for giving me this opportunity. I'd like to start by um, telling you a story. And, Chances are many of you have experienced this at some point already, um, but I wanna establish some context and kind of the most classic case at which uh, inner source is used and into it and probably in many other places. And this is our priority wars or the tale of two teams. And it goes something like this. You have two teams, team A and B. Team A is using team B service, their dependence, and they wanna add a new critical feature but unfortunately, B has other higher priority items that they need to get to. Now, normally, team A would have had a couple options, right? They could wait it out, they could find a workaround, build their own solution, um, or maybe even go the escalation route. But our two teams have a superpower, and that is that they know about inner source. For those of you who might be unfamiliar, we know that inner source essentially applies open source methodologies to the way that companies develop software internally. And in this picture, what that means is team A can just go ahead and contribute that solution to team B's code base. And it's a win-win because A gets the feature that they needed, B gets to still commit and deliver to those other higher priority items that they wanted to do. Um, and any future users of team B's service can also then leverage both of these contributions in their own unique circumstances. Sounds like a pretty sweet success story, right? Well, kind of. You see, after making this successful contribution in a post-contribution retrospective, we find that the devs um, on the two teams are a little less than as happy as you would want them to be. Um, and there are some frustrations that are brought up that need to be addressed. On one hand, we have our team A, our contributors that are saying we found it really difficult to move forward because the PRs were wrapped up in debate, we were going back and forth, we had to do a giant refactor, it was very frustrating, um, and you know, we just did not feel supported enough. But on the same, at the same time, our team B, right, our hosts, they said that they were spending too much time supporting our contributors. They felt like it was too hands-on that it eroded their confidence in the team to actually write good quality code. Now that's interesting because although it seems like the two teams were conflicting in their feedback, it, we realized very quickly that both teams just needed to learn how to work together. And that brings me to uh, my first lesson of the day that I want to share with you, which is that inner source is a skill. Just like open source, teams need to refine these specific skills to become successful. And part of that is transforming from a more traditional producer consumer mindset, where, you know, in this case, Team B, um, our hosts were the traditional producers, they were the only stewards for that code base. There was an invisible boundary that meant that they were the only owners, the only ones who ever worked on that code base. Um, and now they need to transform 
into this maintainer contributor mindset where they are actually changing the rules of the game, right? They are moving into this maintainer mindset where they are sharing the ownership of their code base. They have to work and encourage contributors to, um, to, to write code. And similarly with our team A, our contributors, they've usually been just the consumers of code like this, and they need to learn how to navigate this repo that you know, has code that they've never seen before. It could be in a language or a tech stack that they don't typically use. And so you could imagine there are challenges, not just technically of like working together, but also learning how to work together. And for many teams who are adopting inner source for the first time, this first step is the hardest because you don't have that knowledge about what best practices to follow because there has been a system um, that you've been following this whole time and it you know it doesn't align and so a couple of things that people need to figure out is how to ask the right questions before making a contribution what kind of conversations to have how to give and receive feedback you know to get over that initial rejection syndrome where you're like nope i don't like your contribution sorry GitHub close PR, right? <laughs> and we also want to learn how to document context and decisions. You could see in the retrospective that both teams had kind of an eroded trust and it came from having to provide too much or too little support depending on who you're asking. And part of that comes from not knowing how to actually document your context and your decisions in a way that helps your contributors. And finally, everybody just needed to overcome the fear of change. And like I said, this was a success story. And so it does have a happy ending. And that is that after having those retrospectives, the two teams were able to work together to figure out, okay, what are some things that we can do to help each other? What are ways in which, you know, details we can include in our PRs? Maybe we can have office hours um, and just find a way to improve this working uh, collaboration ship. And so over time, as they started getting more practice in this new model of maintainer contributor, they were able to improve the processes that used to frustrate them. So PRs that used to be wrapped up in debate that took greater than seven days to review were now going smoothly through the pipeline and you know getting resolved in under three days. So that's pretty good. But at Intuit, um, we don't only want to resolve things like this at the team level. And there are some things that we can do and are doing at a company level that can also set up your teams, especially if this is going to be a culture shift for them uh, to be set up for success. The first and foremost is we actually have adopted the standardized based documentation in our source pattern. Um, and the way we did this is our team actually visited all of the different global offices and interviewed our developers, asking the question, what do you need to contribute to a repo that you've never seen before, a code that you've never been, you know, part of? And based on their responses um, and also the patterns documentation itself, they kind of compile this list that you see over here of what Intuit considers our standard based documentation. In addition to that, you can see we also created this uh, tooling where essentially our, our developers, they just put in their, their URL, their GitHub repo, and it automatically scans their repo to give them a unique and thorough scorecard on, oh, here are all of the requirements. Um, here are the requirements that you've met. Here are the requirements you've not met. Um, and, you know, these things drop down to show you exactly why that requirement was met or not and what it is and why it's there. Um, so overall, I thought that was super exciting, but, you know, it's not just enough to have a documentation and a pretty looking tool to help people um, use it. It's also important to educate teams on code review culture. As we saw in the previous slide, it wasn't just that the documentation wasn't up to date. There was a feedback loop that was sort of broken. And so something that Intuit also does is actually for our new hire training, all new hires um, go through a session essentially on what inner source is and also how to review code within the inner source context. 
And so what are those strategies for success? How do you get over and develop empathy for your contributors and vice versa? And I'll talk a little bit more um, later in this presentation as to what some of those uh, tips we have for you know, helping people learn how to review code in an inner source culture. So that's lesson one. For lesson two today, I wanted to talk about how inner source is a choice. Now, we already showed how there is a sort of an upfront investment when you first get started with inner source. There's a sort of a little hill that you have to climb because there is a lack of knowledge, a lack of information about best practices, and just a lack of practice in itself. But even beyond that, when you want to adopt inner source at a big scale and you want multiple teams to do inner source, you have to add incentives so that they actually choose inner source. If you go back to the tale of two teams, our priority wars, our team A, they had other options. They might not be the best options, but given their circumstances, they very well could choose those other options. And for a lot of teams, they already have processes, right? Regardless of how nice or easy that process is, it's a process and it's there and it's working. And so change can be really scary. And one of the things that into it that we're really trying to lean into is making collaboration a goal. Like it's not just a choice that a team has to make with no support from everybody else, but rather the entire company has chosen to make collaboration a goal. And we want to do things to ensure that everyone is set up for success. So a couple of ways in which we've done that. The first one is inner source is actually now a requirement in our tech majority model. So as engineers, as you're developing assets and sort of growing them into platform assets, we have a tech majority model for how well self-serve that asset is. Um, and complying with those standard-based documentation, being inner source ready, is actually one of the requirements to be considered um, mature and in, in, according to the model. The other thing we do is all of our new repos, when they are generated, um, they actually come bootstrapped with that documentation already in place. So instead of trying to figure out, oh, what do I need to add? How do I add it? A lot of that comes for free when you're starting a brand new repo. And you can just go ahead and add information specifically relevant to your team. But finally, and I think most importantly, as in terms of incentives, the question that I get the most from other devs is always, well, okay, so I write all this code for someone else, and then who gets the credit? Who gets promoted? Who gets the shout out? And the answer to that question should be everyone involved, right? And so at a leadership, at a management level, any work that you do that is an inner source contribution, whether that you know, is a small one or a big one, it should still be considered promotable work. And if they're making announcements, sending Slack messages, creating newsletters, you should still get a shout out. But even beyond that, there are a couple little things that I think are really sweet um, and, you know, just help people feel recognized and supported when they are going through this process. The first one is this profile badge you see over here. On our employee profile, if you have contributed via inner source, if you went and did all the work to ensure that your documentation complies, right? Um, or if you have supported and encouraged inner source efforts on your team, regardless of who you are, individual contributor, manager, et cetera, um, you get the sweet looking profile badge so that everyone knows um, that you really helped and were an early adopter and supporter of the inner source program. The other thing that we have done for a couple of our repos is at the repo level, based on your commit history, you get automatically added to the repo, kind of like in the screenshot, um, with your information and what kind of you know um, contribution you made. This screenshot specifically has been anonymized, but is from one of our design systems. And so they also took it a step further and they put these little emojis to talk about the kind of contribution you made, whether it was documentation, and fix, uh, component design, accessibility, etc. And out of all of the different ways in which we get incentive, this is honestly one of my favorites as a developer. The first time my photograph <laughs> and my name showed up on the contributing uh, README, it just it felt such, like it felt like such a badge of honor, and it really felt like we were being recognized for the effort it took, um, you know, to to do this kind of work. Finally, um, I want to talk about the last lesson of the day, and you know, which is that inner source 
It's a community. I've talked a lot about documentation so far, and that's partially because at Intuit, our, um, our first step in our inner search journey was to standardize the documentation. So our tooling, the uh, calculator that I shared with you earlier, um, also the dashboards that we have for our leadership, and just in general, the requirements for our tech maturity model, et cetera, kind of hinge on the existence of this standard-based documentation. But I imagine we all know that you know, documentation is not enough. And when you're moving quickly in an environment, you're trying to get features out, you're working against the clock um, based on whatever situation that's going on in your company, chances are your documentation is going to get um, out of date very quickly. And a lot of teams, mine included, we kind of go through periods. We don't have this like continuous um, stream of doc updates. Instead, it's like we have our crunch time and then we're like, oh, documentation is out of date. And we spend a little bit of time updating everything. And then we go back into crunch time and we keep cycling. And so it's important not just to put emphasis on documentation and standards like that, but also to build a community. And for inner source to be really successful, to go from something that is a one-time thing. I, you know, I did it one time. I contributed to the repo. It was fun to know we have a working relationship with this other team. We have a shared ownership of this code base. We are all in this together um, you have to build a community and you have to have mentorship opportunities that our maintainers our hosts can provide to our contributors it's something that people don't often talk about so new maintainers new hosts in the inner source community can sometimes be caught off guard by the amount of time they have to spend guiding others um, because the assumption is oh these are other engineers at our company right they should just be able to make a pr that's completely perfect but Chances are they are very new to the repo, so it's really important to show them the same grace that you would give to someone who is brand new on your team. Because again, we're not going from this producer consumer mindset, we're doing maintainers, contributors. And so when you're a contributor, it shouldn't matter what team you're coming from. If you are on their team or on a different team, there shouldn't be an us versus them distinction necessarily. Um, and so this brings me to the last thing. I wanted to share with you, which is the mentorship cheat sheet. Like I mentioned in our new hire onboarding, we actually walk through this exact example. Um, we give a little bit more code details on how to do the review, um, but we show these exact steps um, and these tips to all of our new hires um, and engineers to just help them learn about what to expect and common biases that they might be you know, um, experiencing when they are reviewing code that is from another team um, and how they can show that same grace. So what, the, what does that look like? The first one, don't say no, explain why. Um, instead of, you know, just automatically rejecting a contribution because it doesn't meet your standards or you don't like the pattern that they used. Um, on my team, for example, we got a huge, huge contribution and they used um, a pattern in their testing that we had actually deprecated, but they hadn't mentioned that anywhere. Um, and so we wanted them to change everything and it was incredibly frustrating for everybody. It's okay to try to explain, okay, why did we deprecate the pattern? Why are we not, you know, going to accept this contribution the way it is? And then also leverage the insights from the contributors to improve our own processes and our documentation. By doing that, we were able to realize, oh, this was a context that we didn't realize needed to be documented um, or we forgot was important until it, you know, somebody else was using it. The other thing is to develop deep empathy and into it, we really care about getting into your customer's shoes. And I always say inner sources like your the other developers are your customers and, and your code base is the product. Um, and it's important to remember that your contributors, if they are new to the code base, they're just like you when you might have started on the team, when you might have started working um, on this code base. And chances are you're gonna learn something from them too, just because they don't know the exact patterns or the exact things that you know, you're know uh, using in your repo doesn't mean that they don't bring their own experiences and might actually use that to make, uh, to leave the campground cleaner than they found it for everyone. And finally, focus on most important. This is something that my team is very guilty of as well. I mean, a lot of teams do this, is you are, 
you got off guard by the contribution sometimes, or you have so many thoughts because it's not what you expected because they don't have that, the context, right? And so you just keep going through the PR and saying, oh, this is wrong, or this needs to be changed, this naming convention is not right, and so on and so forth. And it can incredibly, it can overwhelm your contributors and, and kind of degrade the trust, which is kind of what happened between those two teams, A and B, in my hypothetical scenario that I shared with you earlier, right? That the support that they wanted from each other started not happening because there was too much back and forth. And so a simple way to avoid this is to just start by the most important thing. Instead of overwhelming your contributors, open up conversation, right? You're not grading them and saying, here's all the ways that you have failed. This is a con con conversation like, hi, this is a great example, but can you explain more about why you did this? This is a pattern we would like to follow, so on and so forth. And this can really help establish trust because now your contributors feel like they are entering a conversation um, and not a minefield. Um, but yeah, that is everything that I have for you all today. Thank you so much. Um, for letting me walk you through these uh, top three lessons of mine um, and of course to the InnoSource Commons Foundation for giving me this opportunity.